because we don't have enough air here. Sorry about that. <laughs> there, thank you. Um, I think there are a lot of you here who heard me talk many, many years ago. And I find it difficult to find the subject that I'm going to talk about. Because all of you know I have written this book. This book here is that I, as a child of 13 years old, until I was 15, was in Belsen concentration camp. Now, Belsen concentration camp was liberated on the 15th of April, but maybe I'll go forward on my story, but I want to say that Belsen was liberated, the only concentration camp liberated by the English army. And when I went back there for the first time after 50 years, I met up with the general of the English army. And I must also say, that the English army inherited the camp. They didn't know what it was. But some German officers had gone to the front, the English front, and you can find photos of that on the internet, where the officers were blindfolded and taken to, the, to whoever was in charge of the English army there. And they offered back in Belsen, uh, they wanted to give back in Belsen to the English in their care on the condition that there wouldn't be any fighting around the camp. Because they told them that that was a DP camp, a displaced person camp. That's what they told the English, English uh, army. And, uh, oops, and, so, and so what happened after negotiating for many hours, it was decided that the English army would get 48 square kilometers of land, which was surrendered to the English army unconditional. They became the owners of that land. And there was one condition attached. Why they gave that to them was that they were scared because the whole camp, as you know, we had 60,000 people in that camp on the 1st of January 1945. And by the 15th of April, when we were liberated, 40,000 had died in this camp from starvation. So uh, you can imagine what was there. And only a few days ago, I had on my Facebook how it really happened. They have released now this film, When Night Falls, that is the one from, from Auschwitz. But that film is being made found back after many, many years in the archive of the Imperial British, um, ah, I can't think of the name, but where all the archives are being kept from in England. Uh, 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 Imperial English, uh, the, the, wait a minute, the Imperial War Museum, there you are, but in the archives, that's where they found that film back. And they have restored it now, and it's now going all over the world, and you can go and see it. But two days ago, I had it on my Facebook, and there came the original one, but the, the, the cameraman from the army, they took, they took these films. But you can imagine, these English armies, they thought that they would come into a DP camp. And the condition was that they have to make sure that the the people inside there, that they wouldn't spread out over the country because we all had typhus. We had typhus. And so they said they had to keep the people there. So you can imagine when the English drove in there with their tanks and they saw, and if you read the many, many books which there are, like Belson Remembered, what came out in, nine, in 2005, and where Richard Dimbleby, who was the uh, a journalist from the BBC, wrote to them on the 17th of, May of, of April. His report 
what they found in the camp in London, they didn't believe them. They said, are you making this up? That is propaganda. And he said, if you don't believe me, I, I set myself in a moment's notice. I retire, I'm finished. You have to report it. And so then they did, that was the first thing. But also in this thing, I know I'm not telling you my story, I tell you other things which are part of the history. In this book from Belson Remembered, Richard Dimbleby says that he came on the far end. I have kept the worst part to the end, he writes, in his dispatch. And his dispatch was dated the 17th of April, 1944. So two days after the liberation, when really the journalists came in. First it was the English army, but then the journalists came in, the, the, the cameramen came in, and they started to take they started to take pictures of what a uh, film of whatever was happening there. And Richard Dimbleby got with his jeep to the far end of the camp, and that's where the children's house was. The children's house at Belson was situated only two barracks away, and he wrote, when I came to the end of this camp, I found there a big open pit to the size of a tennis court. It was halfway filled up with dead bodies and dead bodies. And in my book, if you ever read it, I reported the same thing on the 17th of April, 1945. I say I woke up at 6 o'clock in the morning and the trucks are driving the dead bodies which were laying everywhere, of course. And as sometimes as high as that door, the opening of a door. And from here, right across to where the railway line is and the width of this room. So high that you have no about 40,000 of them that had died. So what happened is that, that uh, I saw these trucks, I woke up, I, had, I was just recovering from typhus, and I woke up and I heard these rumblings of trucks going past my window. So I wake up and I see this truck loaded with dead bodies, and with corpses, I should say, and it was on its way to this pit with Richard Dimbleby, describes in his first dispatch. And I am using the same language in my book. I didn't know it should didn't will be. But why am I telling you that? I am going back to Belson now for the commemoration. 70 years ago on the 15th of April, on my mother's birthday, we were liberated at 3.30 in the afternoon when the big tanks came up the middle of the, of the main road and with a loudspeaker in three different languages, in French, English, and some other language, I don't know which the other language is, but I know it's French and English, they told, and in German, that's right, in German, French, and English, they announced that you are free, you are free, because be, but stay here, stay here, we will bring you help and everything. Of course, when they drove into the camp, that was the road in the middle. They had no idea what was happening behind the fences. You see, back in Belsen was a camp that was divided by the big road in the middle. And then they divided these little camp on one side of the road into smaller camps. One was the Star Camp, where I had been Come, come from Holland with my parents. And then the, he had the Hungarian camp, he had the gypsy camp, he had the, the, the dual nationality camp, and then you had the Heflung camp. The Heflung camp were the Polish prisoners who were already for years, 11 and 14 years, and they had come from Poland. The first Poles that came in, I also describe in my book, were sent there because they had to build barracks. You see what happened? You all have heard of those death marches. Because Belsen was really, in the beginning, a nice camp. It was clean, and the only thing that was wrong with it, that they didn't give us anything to eat. What we got to eat was only, what I got to eat was only four centimeters of black bread, as black as this gentleman's shirt, it's not the bread that you and I ate every day, eat every day today. It's a hard bread, four centimeters of it. 
and, the, and it was and the Germans put vinegar in it when they, when they cooked it, so the fungus wouldn't grow in it, and I could keep it for months because that's how they kept it right. But four centimeters is about that that thick, and of course there were people in Belsen. The first, I have forgotten to tell you everything now from the beginning how we got there, but I will get there in a minute. But now that I'm in Belsen, I must tell you for the first few weeks when we got there, they gave us only, for the first 13 weeks, they gave us only a brown watery soup with here and there a piece of pars parsnip or carrot floating in it. There was no salt in it and there was no meat in it and they gave us three quarters of a liter. But I was a little girl of 13 at the time, and then the entering of the camp, we were given a brown en enamel bowl, uh, you know, the big soup bowl it was. And in that soup bowl, we collected every day our brown soup. And of course, that was the only sustaining thing that we got in the day. And that four centimeters of bread. Now, we didn't cut the four centimeters like that. But we took it sideways and cut it very, very thin. Used to have something in our stomach because it had to last for 24 hours. So you can understand, as a little girl, I got exactly the same rations as the grown up people, as the adults, and with men of six foot tall. And of course, they started to get so hungry, and first up, six foot tall men started to die. And after 13 long weeks, they, we had, had news, because you see, I belong to a group which my father paid a lot of money for, to buy, uh, I must start at the beginning now. When Holland was occupied, the first thing they did was to have a census. Now, before that, they sent people, doctors, nurses, professors, from the education department, from the hospital, everybody who was Jewish and had a job in the government departments were sacked at a moment's notice. So you can imagine, years ago, mom didn't go to work, that there was no money coming in. But what did they do next? They went and confiscated the businesses. So if you have a beautiful uh, um, a factory where you make clothes, or where you make shoes, or where you just have a delicatessen where you have 10 people working, they would, the SS would walk in there with a Grüner Polizei. Now the Grüner Polizei was the sacred police of the SS. And they really know how to scare people. They went bang, 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 and they had the metal under their feet. So you could hear them coming from a long way off. And of course, what the very first thing they did, declare a curfew over whole Holland. Nobody was allowed in the street from 8 o'clock in the night till 6 o'clock in the morning. So if it was that quiet and you hear that bang, 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 you knew that the SS was coming maybe down the door and stopped. I remember many, many times that we heard these heavy footsteps and all of us in the house just froze and held our breath. And even today, after all these years, if the postman knocks on my door, my heart makes a somersault because the brain doesn't forget. That is a terror you have experienced and the brain never forgets that. So if somebody knocks hard at my door, I run down there and I get mad at them. Why do you knock so hard? and the poor people get shocked because they don't understand that I'm so upset. But that's where it came from, because it was not only myself, but all the Jewish people who were waiting in the houses, waiting to be taken up. Now, if these people were taken up, they were put into the trams. And then the, the tram drivers from Holland, I can only speak about Holland. The tram drivers from Holland took these people to the to the railway station and there were the trains waiting where I was in later when I, and they were taken down to Westerbork. Westerbork was the trans, a small camp in Holland. It's a transit camp and from there you went 
to Auschwitz, to Birkenau, to Sachsenhaus, you name it, from there they went to different places. Most of them, of course, went to Auschwitz. But what happened, why did a situation like this exist, that people went so easy? A little boy, if you have seen my film, you see the, the, the channel, um, channel 2, the, what was the report, 7.30 report, on the 29th of November. You can still see it on the, on the internet if you go to iView. You can see it. it was a lovely, lovely small report what they did. Uh, and and, and uh, in there is this little boy. He said, because you see, when they came to Westerbork, there weren't passenger trains. There were cattle wagons. And now that I'm older, I was a girl at the time. You know, we didn't think, who would think of that people would do these kind of things? Because we were told, you have to come to Germany. It is only a relocation. Father, you will be getting accommodation. Father and the, the family and the children, mother can stay at home, look after the children. Dad has to go in the factory because our men are on the front fighting. And the people believed that. Oh, they knew it wasn't going to be nice and easy, <clears throat> but they believed it. So when they came to the door and they were dragged out of the houses and then in the tram and in the train, that were passenger trains, and then after sometime a few days, sometime two weeks, sometime a month, they were sent to these different, in the different trains, they were cattle wagons. And we should have known, if you want to have people to come to work for you, you must keep them in a good condition. But they put these people in the cattle wagons, and you have seen what was on the television about Auschwitz. And what, what you really haven't known is that these trains arrived. And if you look at the internet, they were told the men to the left and the wife and the children to the right. And you can clearly find pictures of that on the internet. And if you look at these pictures, the people have been driving for two days in those, traveling for two days in those cattle wagons. There was no evolution, there was, there was no water, there was no food, you couldn't sit down. 100 people in an area not bigger than that, there were squashed in. You can only get 5,000 in it. And they squashed 100 people in there. And sometime it took them two days to arrive. So when these doors opened, they were pulled out of it. Some of them had died already. And then they were told to split up. The men on the left and the woman on the right. And sometime, of course, a husband would walk over to the wife and the children. Well, he sees his wife standing there and he sees So he walks over. It was all very quiet there when they arrived. Very civilized when they arrived. There was no harsh treatment or anything. Everything was done very quietly. So when a husband walked over to say something to his wife or to be with his wife, someone would come up to him and say, look, sir, you better go to your queue because the woman and the children are taking the truck to the camp and you men have to walk. Now, there is not one father or husband who will deny his wife the, the right to go with the truck and go and have a look at that picture on the internet. You see how peacefully and quiet they're standing there waiting. And then the truck would come and load the children up and the wives. They only go about a kilometer down the road and they were told to come out and they were given a towel and a piece of soap. And, uh, and they were told they were going to have a shower. So they were all undressed and then went into a room, not bigger than this. And when they walked in, they saw the shower heads overhead. And then they pushed in 700 people in a room like this, the little ones between the legs. You can imagine they was already panicked. They start to realize now that something was very wrong. The doors were hermetically closed. And there are also pictures of it. And as Esman would climb on the roof and through a little hole not bigger than a square, a square foot, he dropped in a canister of Cyclone B gas. And within three minutes, they were all dead. 
And then after a while they opened the door, and they were not finished yet. They opened the door, they dragged the bodies out. You know years ago, I remember it, I'm 85, I do remember it, that when you had a hole in your teeth, there was no ceramics. There was only gold, 22 karat gold that they could fill this hole up with. So lots and lots of people had gold in their mouths. And they had this special group of men, they were prisoners. My father's brother was, had been one of them, we were told later, by someone. And they were called the Sunder Commando. They had that special task to drag the people out of the guest rooms and then shave off all the hair. And then if there was any cold feeling, they had to knock the teeth out of the mouth. And these people were naked, don't forget. All the towels and pieces of soap were collected again for the next lot. And so on the trolley, they went down to the crematoriums. There were four crematoriums. They burned seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And every day they killed and cremated from 2,000 to 2,500 people. And what I'm telling you is the truth. There are a lot of people here who, in the world who are denying it. But the, the proofs are still there. They tried to demolish it, but they couldn't. And so, that was not all. When they had the people in the crematorium, and I made some arrangement and asked if the crematorium did the same thing here. No, that was not the same. Here, it's not the same, but there. Three could fit, small people could fit in one time into one burning unit, and I had about eight of them in some other part, maybe some more, but there were eight, there were four burners. And I put these people in there to cremate them. But you know, you and you and me, we all have fat in our body. And so in the beginning they had a lot of trouble because the fires would go out. Because it was not gas, it was wood fire that they used in these old fashioned ovens. And so our fat would drip in there. And so they had thought of a way. They sluiced the fat away while they were cooking the fat of our bodies. They sluiced away about a kilometer further on. There was a huge lake and it was full of human fat. And they made soap out of it. That was most probably the pieces of soap that they gave to the people when they arrived. And it was only about two weeks ago that some terrible person put on the Facebook, on the internet, showing an old box with one piece of square soap. And he said, that soap is made from Jewish fat. And he offered it on eBay. On, the, on, the, on eBay it was offered. You can imagine, I happened to see that. And I thought, well, there you are, but I'm telling you there is proof of it, that I'm telling you the truth. And so you see, of course it was removed straight away of Facebook and also, of course, of eBay. I personally, I should have bought it. I personally bought of eBay letters from a man, a young man, who wrote a letter. He was a Polish young man of 21 and he wrote to his parents. He was also in Auschwitz, a prisoner. And they made us do it too. Write to our family, everything is fine, everything is okay. And of course, he wrote to his parents. And that was an eBay. Letters from Auschwitz. The first letter I bought, I didn't want it to go around the world. So I bought it. And a couple of months later, there were three offered. It cost me a lot of money, but I bought it, and I have it home. And I was actually trying, but if, I, if you read the letter, what happened with Auschwitz? When German occupied Poland, he, he uh, imprisoned practically the whole army, and they put them in the barracks of Auschwitz, and made those young men build the gas ovens and built more and more barracks and everything. And lots of these Polish young men died, and they were not Jewish. And how did I found out? Because I contacted Yad Vashem, 
As you know, he knows from Israel that Yad Vashem is a huge museum in Holland, or, uh, in, in, in Israel, in, in, in honor or to record forever the horrors that has happened there. And I wrote to Yad Vashem, if they have any knowledge whatsoever, I actually didn't write, I first sent an email and then I rang up. I wanted to know with the first letter if it was a death, if it was false, or if it was real, that letter what I had bought. Now, I don't want to keep this letter, believe me. I offered it to Israel, to the Yad Vashem. I said, please, you can have this in the museum. I didn't want it to be sold all over the world. And answer came back, because in the letter, he had to put his name, the date when he was born, and the barrack he was in, when he had arrived and everything. And of course, I gave all this information to Yad Vashem. I forgot his name, I can't remember his name. And Yad Vashem came back to me and said, indeed, this young man has been in Auschwitz. We've got the records of it. We, he, was, he was number so and so, 500 to 5,000 and something. He had this number and his name was so and so. They had all the records up there. And I said, wonderful, if it is a real letter, I want you to have it. You can have it in the museum. Unfortunately, I only know Jewish museums. They cannot accept it. I am against it. I do not think that is right. If they have the history of Auschwitz, they should also have the history of the people who built it. But Red Vashem could not accept it because it had to be all Jewish people. I went to every Jewish museum in Europe and all came back with E, including Bergen Belsen, who is not typical Jewish, it is a, a Jewish cemetery now. And Bergen Belsen said they could not take it because he had not been in Bergen Belsen, but he'd been in Aussie. So I'm still having the letters. And I'm sure that I will give them, I will donate them to the museum in Auschwitz because they at least can look after them. After. But the terrible thing from people to go and have this misery and put it on eBay. I paid nearly $400 for those three letters, but I didn't mind that because I didn't want it to go. But now coming back to our story, sorry if I got taken away from you about, about this. So when they arrived then, and they took it out, and then they had to soak. And that is the story that I tell you from our They killed six million Jews, two million gypsies, and one million homosexuals. In total, they managed to kill 11 million people in the concentration camp. And let me tell you, it really happened because I was there. Now, when the English came in, of course, like I told you, they were giving 48 square meters of land, unconditional, surrendered in the middle of Germany, but surrendered to the English. When I got there 50 years later and I met up with the general, I said to him, I mean, don't forget it, it was 50 years later. We had left the war behind us, you know. I had made a new life here and tried to put all this behind me, but I couldn't, I had to ask him. I said to him, do you still have the land? He said, yes. No, I didn't say that. I said, did you give the land back? He said, no. Why should I give the land back? He said, we've got it and we're going to keep it. He said, I've got 20,000 men uh, 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 stationed here in this area. Um, how do they call that army there in Europe? Is it the United Nations Army or something? But anyway, it was under English control. And when I was there in 2007, I met the general in 2005 with my daughter. And I asked him if they still had the land. He said, yeah, we're not giving it back. Of course, when I tell that to the, to the kids in the schools, they think that's marvelous. England is not giving the land back, you see. And so this, this uh, I must say, with, very sadly, that only this month, the English have left Belsen and they have given the land back to them. But the 45, 48 square meter was in such a way 
No war would be fought over it. No damage would be done. The SS had to disappear on the, on the night of the 14th of April, by 12 o'clock at night, it was the deadline. All the SS, what were in the camp, hundreds and hundreds of them, disappeared with the truck. And if you read in my book, you can read it, that the SS is sending a message to Sister Luba, the woman who, the woman who saved the life of 40 Dutch children. And she came to my bed. And she said, are you, I had typhus. I was just, just recovering. And then, and she said, he said, Maximilian is sending a truck tonight. He's sending a truck to the back gate. So I can come with all the children on the trucks and we can get away from Belson. Ha, I couldn't even stand on my feet. And uh, all, all our children, of the 46, but then we had about 80 because the Polish children had come in too. The whole place, and, and, the, uh, and the English called it a hospital because everybody was sick in the bed or just recovering. And so uh, the SS had to leave by, the, by 12 o'clock, the 14th of April. And unfortunately, most of them went. And I ask for today still, how come that Joseph Kramer and 60 others decided to stay behind. And that's when they got punished. The others got away. 165 of them have never been brought before the court. But the others got, got and Joseph Kama was hanged. Irma Geyser was hanged. And unfortunately, some of them had been given 20 years, and five years later, they were out. And they had a good life, the, these people, including Rao. Rao, who I'm describing in my book, who hit up Sister Helen, who lives in Israel, so badly a week before the liberation. And I heard when I was back there in 19, 1995 that he had been living in, in what's the name, Cellar, 10 kilometers away from Belson Lived a very peaceful life like nothing has happened. And it was an amazing thing. How these monsters, these terrible monsters, what they did, once the war was over, they became natural people like you and I again. They started to work and they're the family you take. This Charles Shante, what we have here. The biggest criminal there is, he killed that little Hungarian boy. The two others tortured him so badly in front of the other prisoners. That's why the father found out what happened to his 18-year-old boy. And yet, here this government, because it didn't say at the time, they said they wanted him as the war came along. Now, our, our governor, Malcolm McCusker, as you know, he was, his, he was his lawyer until I told him what really happened there in Europe. And of course, He's not so sure now if he's innocent. But the thing is how he got away with it, because at that time during the war, the word war criminal did not exist. And that is the reason that our honorable judges in their wisdom didn't send that man overseas because they were scared he would be tortured to get the weapon. But you see, they had Letters, Malcolm McCusk, Mr. McCusk, Malcolm McCusk told me, or wrote to me in a letter, that he had witnesses who were there. They were the same as, as people as this, this, this Charles Sente. And they had given the Amy David, they lived in, the, one of them became 93, another 95. And they had given the Amy David that they were there in, in, uh, in uh, Budapest, and that, what's his name, that Charles Sente had left, the day when the boy died, he had left Budapest. Yeah, but the boy didn't die because of the day, the boy died because of the days what they had done to him before. And that's how they got him off, no. But anyway, this is because we have wonderful people in Australia. We really have such good people.
people here in Australia because it all happened so far away. People cannot just imagine what happened up there. And this country, when I came off the boat 61 years ago, I came off the boat as a 24-year-old girl with a little two-year-old girl. And let me tell you, never ever did anybody except only one person on the bus because I was a bus conductor when I came here. And she called me bloody New Australia. I never ever anybody else said that. But to that lady I said, I said, yes, madam. I said, I may not be an Australian. I said, but you are only Australian, I said. And everybody in the bus clapped. That was really, was my only experience. But for never ever did I have trouble I always had lovely relationship with the people and I hope, I sincerely hope that this country will never change. It will never change and that it always stay, stay. Now only one more story I told you. Now I know I haven't told you my things out of the book, but you can read the book. But let me tell you what I experienced in 2007. We were 40 children, 42. and. Two of us died. Two of our children died. One is a one-year-old boy who as S officer, he was a very handsome looking SS officer, had given him a mid-ear operation and little flip he died. Yeah. So that was a terrible thing that was the first one of our group of children. Because you see, they had taken our parents away. My father was sent away in a penalty transport to we now know to Sachsenhausen. And the next day on the 5th of December, they sent our mothers away on penalty transport because that was the diamond group. And the SS wanted the, the group who were only the diamond workers, they were not big jewelers or anything, demanded that they hand over lots of diamonds so they can start their own diamond factory there. And because they didn't have the diamonds, they put them on penalty transport. The men, and there were, I think, 420 of them, only three returned. One was my father, one was the father of little Robbie, which is, I described in my book, and the other man, I cannot remember his name. But my father told me many years later that he said to the other two men when they were separated from the diamond group, that will cost us our life. And little Robbie's father said, Mr. Englander said, no, why? Maybe that will be the chance that we stay alive. And that is what came out of it. Of course, they, they suffered terribly. But if they would have stayed with the diamond group, they were totally in a, I, in a and I can't find the word, they destroyed. And I, I can't say it. <laughs> and so, so what happened? We can't find a trace of him. My father tried for years and years to go through the books and, and information. He never found out what happened to the other 400 people, and my father's brother Max was in there. But in this book, I also described that two of our children died, and one of them was Lane, Helena. Her photograph is in here. You can later have a look at it. It's in the back, and you can see Lainey, as she was as a 10-year-old girl, and Lainey, the day after the liberation, when she is very sick, and if you look at the hands, her arms are sticks and everything that shows you what the body. Four days after the liberation, Lainey, Lainey died. And we children, I describe it in the book, we wanted to look, where was she buried? We wanted to know. Because all the others went in unnamed graves, but that is a little cemetery set up after the liberation by the English, and that's where the people were not putting in a mass grave, but they were making long trenches and putting the people next to one another. And I describe in there that we decide we're going to find out where Lenny is buried. And I'm talking after we were liberated. We were taken from the dirty, filthy camp to a clean camp, which I call in my book the display, uh, the, the recuperation camp. And that is in fact that camp that the English control. And so we, we, um, 
we went walking for the first time in freedom. We could walk. We could go out in the bush. We could walk on the roads. Nobody stopped us. And so we walked and we found the little cemetery. And we walked in and I had already written Rainy's name on a piece of paper in the house. So when we came to the cemetery, a small one it is only, a tall man came up to me and I could see he was still very weak because he was shaking. And he asked me in Polish, ask us in Polish, maybe he asked, what are you doing here? Maybe he said, what are you looking for? Maybe he said, can I help you? But we didn't understand him. He spoke Polish and we spoke Dutch and a little bit of German. So I handed him the piece of paper. We were looking for Lady, and Lady's name was written on that piece of paper. I handed it, thinking that he was the guardian of the cemetery. So he walked over, across, about in the garden, and, and he had a, a little table there. And you know what? Three months ago, I dreamt I was back there. And in my book, I said he had a little table. But it wasn't a table, because I clearly could see it in my dreams. You know these old-fashioned fruit, uh, uh, fruit uh, vegetable, wooden boxes there used to be in the vegetable shop, they were all made from wood? He had three of them stuck on top of one another, and that was his table. And I had to find it out two months ago when I went back. You see, sometimes you go back that you have been. Sometimes you relive it, but thanks God it's not really hurting me like it did all these years ago. I have put that behind me. So he came back, this man, and pointed to row two. And in my book, I describe it, that Lainey is buried in the second row, which had just started. And in 2007, I'm in Belsen, because they're opening up their new museum an 11 million euro museum they built and the, where they can show people who come what happened in the camp and what didn't happen in the camp. And then of course there is the huge cemetery with all the mass graves. And there was in the, in the area which the English still had in their possession a big hole that used to be the mess for the officers and 1,400 people were sitting there, and we all had the ear thing and a computer, and if they were speaking in Russian, I could hear it in English. And that went on for three hours, and then I had enough. <laughs> and I went outside, standing like this. There was a wall there, and I'm standing like this, and my publisher from Germany comes and stands next to me. Five minutes later, the hall is like a theater. It had different doors open up. 1,400 people stream out of the doors. It was finished. Everybody was relieved after three hours to be able to walk out. And so, as I look at these people, I'm standing on the side, I see in the distance two tall men, Kassidic Jews, with the big black hat and the pipe girls and all dressed in black. And I had never seen them in the previous visit that I was there, any Cassini Jews up there, because they usually stay clear of a cemetery. So I'm looking, and as they, they come close, being a very curious person, I call up over the heads of the streaming people, hello, where do you come from? I say to the man. And one of them answers, he said, Brooklyn, New York, lady. And as then he gets closer, I said, what are you doing here? Which is, of course, a very stupid question to ask. What did you do? But I was so shocked that he answered me. For the first time in my life, I had to look for words. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said to me, in walking, he said, my grandfather gave the Hebrew Kaddisha to the people who died after the liberation. Hebrew Kaddisha means the final rites. And as this gentleman can be my witness, the final rights are given, there must be 10 men present for them to say the prayers of the death. There was the person, there were all in white, Muslim, white cloth, very thin cloth, 
and then the ten men say the prayers for the dead before they can be buried. And that's called the final rites. And he says to me, I gave, my grandfather gave the people who died to heaven. Well, I was there. I was there. I know that it's not possible. Absolutely not. So, he sees on my face that that isn't true. I was in the camp, there was such a chaos. Where we get the white cross from? Where were the ten men when I visited the, the cemetery? There was only one man. And he said to me, not real, but he said the prayers. And they were gone. And as I see those two tall men disappearing in the distance, my heart is pounding. And I know that the grandfather is the man I met on the, we met on the cemetery when we went looking for lady. And so when I get back to Australia, I ring up Belson. And I said, who were those two men who came there? He said, yeah, well, they're the grandson of Christina Walzer. So, and this is the email address. I want the email address. I want to contact the son, Abraham Walzer, who couldn't come because his father had just died. The old man was 93 by then. So what happened? I went on the internet, of course, looking for, to find the phone number. And I came across the story, the death book, of Berg and Belsen, the, the death book, the totem book of Berg and Belsen. And the whole story is about Cassina Walzer. And I'm reading the whole story, and I'm coming to it. What happened? This Cassina Walzer, what I've seen with my own eyes, wrote in the book everybody's name who died. But he did it, of course, in, in Hebrew, because he happened to be a a person, you know the Jewish Torah, the scroll, is, is made by hand, written by hand in a very special lettering. And if to make one mistake, the scroll is finished. They can't make a mistake. So it is very special persons who are trained and trained, and he was one of them. And so he had described in a book which an accountant used, you know, hardcover the accountant book? That was all that we could get hold of after the war. There was nothing there. He had written down in there 1,550 names. And Belson had found out that the son had that book. And of course, Belson wanted that book for the museum, for history, for, you know, forever. And so they couldn't give it to Belson, because it was enemy land. But what they do, they lend it to them for 10 years. Of course, Belson had to make a donation to the synagogue, but that is, that is life. So this book, and also the son, Abraham Walzer, the son of Cassina, undertook it to translate the, the book which was written, the death book which was written in Hebrew, into English. He couldn't speak German, so it is in English. So when I found all that out, I rang Belson again, and I spoke with the historian. I said, you got that book there. Can you do me a favor, please? Will you go and have a look if you can find Lady's name in the book? And the answer came back over the internet. Lady is buried in row number two, in section A. Row number two, grave number three. And that is exactly as I wrote it in my book. So I want you to be assured, whatever I wrote in this book did happen. It is the truth, and I can remember everything like yesterday. Thank you for listening to me. And I'm going to go back there next in two weeks' time. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Pardon? Did you? Uh, did you? Did your mother survive? Thank you so much. I hope. I hope it was very. Oh, of course. Yeah, my pleasure. I hope I don't pull my own one. <laughs> Here you are. 
Number 62. J62. J. J62. J for John. Number 62. Maybe. I have 54. I haven't got it. What is it, darling? Do I need to give it to you? Can you a bottle of wine or a box of chocolates? What would you Oh, no, I prefer a bottle of wine. Here, a red one. Yeah. Retreat. That's the red one. That's the red one. Like yeah, I'll have it. Yes, I can only do mine. Is this for me? Oh, thank you. Yeah, she did that. Anytime. 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 Yeah, she did that. You know, what? and just one more thing. I'm going back to Belton on the 7th of April. And I'm going first to Holland because my little niece is there with her husband. And I'm taking my sister-in-law with me because my two brothers have passed away. And she has been in Belton before. And if you go to Holland and my little niece wants to know everything in Amsterdam, to where we live, where I went to school,
to go there to the Norman beaches to, uh, to the Omaha beach. Yeah, I have to see that. And also the Canadian one wants to see this time. And after that, we fly to Seville. Now that's a, a quick story. One day I get an email. Family of Seville. I haven't got any family in Seville. Of 330 family members, only eight returned. So I never heard of a family in Seville. So then she reads, writes to me. She said, my great-grandmother was the youngest sister of your grandmother. Yeah. My name is Cynthia Wood. Wow, a light ended up in me in 1938, many years ago. Jack Rothfeld, the son of uh, his auntie, her name was Doug 